Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about stability. Again, we've talked about stability in past lectures, uh, but here I'm going to get into a bit more detail about types of stability and robustness and other topics that we haven't quite covered yet. Okay, so stability is the resistance of a system to having its equilibrium disrupted. So a system either is stable or it is not. It either is resistant to losing its equilibrium or it is not. Uh, it's also sometimes defined as the ability to be firmly fixed or supported. So both are they're kind of two aspects of the same definition. So when it comes to joint stability, on practical terms, um, all joints must be stable to withstand forces, allow mobility, and avoid pain and injury. Okay, so joints must be stable for them to function correctly and allow for that joint to act in all the ways that it needs to act. Joint instability is actually a symptom, not a sign. So a symptom is something that is subjective and has to be reported by the person experiencing it versus a sign is objective and is something that is a measurable characteristic or something that we can observe as an outside you know, from an outside perspective. Uh, so joint instability is actually something that we cannot directly measure. Uh, so that is something that a person who is experiencing it would report to us. Um, and they may not say my ankle is unstable because they may not even know what that means. Uh, but they would say something like, uh, when I try to step onto my right foot, my ankle gives out. That is them expressing to you that they feel like their ankle is unstable and like that their ankle can't bear their full body weight. Um, so that is joint instability. Joint laxity is the amount of give of the inert structures of a joint. Uh, by inert structures, I'm talking about the joint capsule, ligaments, um, the bursas, the meniscus, or whatever kind of articular discs might be there. Um, so we're talking about the inert structures, the ones that can't produce force. Um, so the amount of give of those inert structures in a joint, and that's a clinical sign, meaning that we can measure that. So we can measure the sort of give or wiggle room that a joint has. Um, and so sometimes joint laxity predicts joint instability or they happen at the same time, but that is not always true. So we can have an unstable joint that is lax or not lax, um, and we can have joint laxity and have the joint be very stable. Okay, so somebody might have a lot of joint laxity, they might be very hypermobile, uh, but still have very stable joints that are able to perform all of the tasks the joints need to perform. Um, so we don't necessarily measure joint laxity and use that to um, predict or interpret joint instability. Those are two separate characteristics. Okay, static and dynamic stability is just like we talked about with equilibrium. Um, static stability would be stability in an unmoving or non-moving system. Dynamic would be uh, stability considered in a moving system. So we need to consider both because the requirements of the system that we're analyzing, um, the requirements to maintain static stability will be different from those to maintain dynamic stability. Uh, so like if we're looking at the spine, for example, what it requires for the spine to be, uh, or to have static uh, stability will be different from what is required for dynamic stability. And even what's required for dynamic stability will depend on what the motion is, what plane are we moving in, um, what degrees of range of motion are we in. Um, so even the requires of requirements of dynamic stability will vary depending on the movement and the system. Okay, so a system either is stable or unstable like we've talked about before, and stability is not measured on a sliding scale. Okay, and we'll talk more as we go through this lecture. Towards the end, I'll talk about why we say more or less stable. Okay, but stability either is or isn't. So like in this picture here, if there was any disturbance at all to that ball on number A, like I could just blow gently on that ball and it's gonna roll away and never return. 
um, without another force acting on it. So that is an example of an unstable system because it can't tolerate even the smallest disturbance without it disrupting its equilibrium. B, if I applied that same disturbance to that same ball, um, it would move, it would roll up and down a little bit, but it would uh, return back to its original position. So that means that that system is stable. So it either is or isn't stable. Uh, so a system is stable if when we give it a little disturbance or disruption in its position or state of motion, um, then the resulting position or behavior will be similar to the old. Okay, so um, in B, if we gave it a little bit of a disturbance, it would rock a little bit and return back to its same position. A stable system will return to the original position, so that would be static stability, or the original trajectory, that would be dynamic stability, following a disturbance. If the behavior of the system after the disturbance is different from where we started, then it's unstable. So if I just blow on that ball in A and it rolls away forever, that was an unstable system because it's not going to return back to its original position. Okay, so here's an example in practical terms when we're looking at the body. Um, so let's say somebody's carrying a big box and they get bumped into by someone else. Um, if they are stable, they will return to the intended trajectory and achieve the goal of the movement. Uh, so like maybe they're walking across the room and, and they were gonna set the box down on the ground. So if they're stable, somebody bumps into them, they might stumble a little bit or something, but they'll, they'll get back up and continue on their original trajectory to achieve the task that they had intended in the first place. If they're unstable, then when they get bumped into, now they might stumble, drop the box, it might hurt them, like maybe now their back is injured or something, um, or in some way, the behavior of this person will be different than what it was uh, before they were bumped, and that would be the disturbance in this example. Now, with that example, it becomes really obvious that it matters a lot how hard the person was bumped. So like where they just barely bumped into and um, like with very, very little force or were they full on tackled. Um, so the size of the disturbance will make a really big difference. So when we're talking about stability, either the person is stable or not. And that would be based on the smallest possible disturbance relative to the context. Okay, so like the person carrying the box, if I did a, you know, <laughs> gently blew on them, uh, we wouldn't expect that to have any effect on them at all. So that wouldn't count as the smallest disturbance. Um, it would be like a small bump. So if I just barely bumped into the person, that would be a small disturbance and either they're stable against that disturbance or they're not. Um, versus like the ball that we saw in the other picture, you know, a gentle blowing on that ball might be sufficient. So that would be the smallest disturbance. Or like this feather in this picture, if we put that on the table, blowing on it or a small breeze would be a small disturbance uh, that would be sufficient to cause it to move. Okay, but if I put a book on the table and blew on it, that would not be considered a small disturbance because no matter, I mean, it'd have to be a hurricane or a tornado or something to blow on that book hard enough that you're gonna cause it to, um, to move. Okay, so stability is context dependent. And that's what I'm trying to explain here is that the type and amount of the disturbance, the size of the disturbance, or what qualifies as the smallest disturbance depends on the context. Okay, so it depends on how big and heavy is this thing and, and uh, what kind of disturbance is going to qualify. So the size of the disturbance that may cause a change in behavior of the system also depends on the context. On some systems, a light breeze might qualify and others that wouldn't be expected to have any effect at all and it would have to be something a little bit more significant. So that's where we get into the issue of robustness. So if we look at stability as a binary measure, meaning there's only two options, either it is or is not stable. Uh, robustness is how we discuss or provide an index for how great of a disturbance a system can withstand while still maintaining its stability or still maintaining its equilibrium. Okay, so robustness 
is the index of stability. So the system either is stable or it isn't. And if it is, then we can describe how great of a disturbance it can withstand as robustness. That's the term that we use to describe that. Um, so it defines how well the system can cope with uncertainties and disturbances, including different positions, variable resistance, injuries or dysfunctions, et cetera. So we're saying that as we change the variables, like, like maybe the, the spine is stable, but as I change the variables, like I have more flexion in the spine or more lateral flexion in the spine, um, or we change the amount of resistance, like instead of just moving against gravity, now you're moving against a resistance band, um, or maybe a ligament is injured. So as we change the parameters of the system, um, how well are we still able to maintain stability? And that is what robustness is measuring. So how big of a disturbance can we withstand? And how resistant are we to all these changes in parameters that could potentially affect the stability of the system? Okay, so an example would be, let's say an athlete is running across the field um, and they get pushed by an opponent. If they're able to return back to their original trajectory and continue, then they were stable. Um, robustness, is a measure of how hard the opponent had to push them to cause them to lose their original trajectory or to cause them to lose their equilibrium. So having a change in, in um, direction of movement. Okay, so if, um, like let's say somebody just gave the slightest push to the person running down the field and that player, that athlete went tumbling and couldn't return back to their original trajectory. You would say that that system, that person was unstable. Um, and so that's why we go through all the stability training and things in athletics is because we're trying to increase the robustness. We're trying to improve, you know, the, the system is either stable or not, but we want to be able to be resistant to greater and greater disturbances, bigger and bigger pushes. So if somebody gave the smallest push and the person fell, then we would say they were unstable. If they give the smallest push and they were able to recover and return to their original trajectory, then we would say they are stable. The robustness is how big of a push they can withstand and still return to their original trajectory. So that's where stability training comes in, is you want to increase the, the size of the push or the size of the disturbance that we can withstand and still be able to continue on. All right, so we combine stability and robustness. So the concepts of stability and robustness are often combined in the way that we discuss these two concepts. Um, so in, instead of stability being a binary measure, so stability is binary, it either is or isn't, but instead of discussing it that way, often we combine that concept with the concept of robustness, and that's when you get a sliding scale of how stable something is. Okay, so really you're describing the robustness of a stable system by, stay, by saying that something is more or less uh, stable. So although a system is either stable or not, the robustness of the system is commonly discussed by saying that the system is more stable or less stable. So really, if we say it's more stable, we're saying the system is stable and it's more robust, okay? Because either it's stable or it isn't. And then we would discuss its robustness. When an individual trains to improve stability, they're in fact training to improve the robustness of an already stable system. Um, and then importantly, the index of robustness or stability can only be defined for a stable system. So if a system is not stable, robustness is zero. We're saying that um, that system cannot withstand any amount of disturbance. If there's any disturbance at all, it will lose its equilibrium. And that, so what we're saying is that it's unstable and therefore we can't even discuss robustness because it can't withstand anything at all, it's zero. Um, similarly, since balance is the ability to control equilibrium, balance is also improved by training to increase robustness or stability of the system. Okay, so 
although these are related and often improve together, these are two separate concepts. Um, so we can improve the robustness of a system, or we could say like we're improving the stability of the system, which really we're improving the robustness. We can do that a lot of different ways. Like uh, if the inert structures are healing or getting stronger or improving in some way, that would increase the robustness of that system. And that is separate from control mechanisms. So control mechanisms would be really our nervous system and how it controls and the commands that it sends to our muscular system and the way the muscular system responds to those commands. Okay, so that's really what we mean when we talk about balance and the ability to control um, equilibrium. We're talking about our nervous system controlling our muscular system and our muscular system controlling our state of equilibrium. So if we're doing that, we are also, like if we improve those abilities, we are also improving the robustness of the system. But it's separate, it's, those are two different ideas because we can also improve the robustness of the system separate from control mechanisms. So when we're training to increase stability, we're really trying to improve the robustness of the system that can happen both through balance training and through improving um, just the, the structures of the system. Okay, performance in this context, and I wanna be specific about that because we could talk about performance in all sorts of areas, uh, but in, <clears throat> in this context, performance is how accurately and quickly a system returns to the original position or trajectory after a disturbance. Okay, so think about the football player running down the field and they get pushed the faster and more accurately they return back to their original trajectory, the greater the performance. So if they kind of stumble away and it takes a while and they then they kind of return back, that would be kind of low performance and performance would increase as they get better at returning back to their original trajectory faster and more accurately. We can only describe performance of a stable system. If we don't expect the thing to return back to its original position or trajectory, then we can't discuss how quickly or accurately it does that. So if it's unstable, zero performance. Uh, performance is improved by increasing the accuracy and or speed of the system's ability to return to the original position or trajectory. All right, linear stability is the maintenance of linear equilibrium. Uh, so the maintenance of linear equilibrium or linear stability is very, very much affected by the mass of the object. So an object with greater mass, um, we're going to need more force to disturb the linear equilibrium, uh, which also is going to mean less mobility. So mobility and stability are often a trade-off. The more stable something is, or the more robust that stable system is, um, usually the less mobility that same st system also has. So less stability usually means more mobility and vice versa. Okay, so something with greater mass is going to require more force to disturb its linear equilibrium, and that's usually also going to mean less mobility. So think about like a big boulder, we're going to require a lot of force to push it and disturb its state of linear equilibrium, um, but it also means we're going to have less mobility of that boulder. It's not going to go as far as a result of the force that I apply to it. Uh, it's going to require a lot of force to cause less mobility. The less the mass of an object, the less force is required to achieve acceleration which is an advantage in sports like gymnastics that require fast change in direction. So there are a lot of sports where we require fast change in direction. And in those sports, the, the athlete would be at an advantage if they, as a, their whole body, if they're of smaller mass. So in some sports or even in some positions within certain sports, um, it's an advantage to be smaller and of smaller mass because it, it gives the ability to have a uh, faster change in direction. And in other sports, it's at a, you're at an advantage if you have greater mass 
because it's going to be harder to move you. So like in football, there's some positions where it's better to have larger mass because it's harder for your opponents to move you. And other positions where it's better to have smaller mass because you're going to be able to, to change in direction much more quickly. Okay, rotational stability. Uh, it's the maintenance of rotational equilibrium. Now, rotational stability is very affected by the mass of the object, just like linear stability. But in rotational stability, the location in the center of gravity compared to the base of support is also really important. Uh, so when the center of gravity is positioned in the middle of the base of support, gravity does not have a moment arm to disrupt equilibrium. Okay, so we're saying, if the center of gravity, so again, that's the direction or the line of uh, gravity, the location of where gravity is being applied to the object, if that line falls within the base of support, then gravity doesn't have a moment arm to cause rotation around the axis, which in that case, the axis would be the boundaries of that base of support. So if a torque is applied to the object that is great enough to rotate the object around an axis formed by one of the edges of the object, then the center of gravity is moved toward the edge of the base of support. Okay, so if we look at our picture here, what we're saying is that the boundaries formed by the tires on this truck, uh, the, the boundaries of the tires, that is the base of support. And in the picture, we have a, a little G marking the center of gravity and a blue arrow pointing down, showing the line of action of that force, of the force of gravity against the weight or the mass of the truck. So now let's say there's a force that comes and pushes the truck to the side. So what we're saying is if a torque is applied to the object, so that would be pushing the truck, that is great enough to rotate the object around an axis, in this case, the axis would be the edge of the tires that are that we're rotating around. Okay, so in this picture, it would be the tires on the left side from our point of view. Um, so it's great enough to rotate the object around an axis formed by one of the edges of the object. Then the center of gravity is moved toward the edge of the base of support. So that's what we see in the picture on the left. So we have torque that caused rotation of that truck up onto one of its edges. And the edges that it's coming up onto, that would be the axis in this case. And it's causing that line of action of gravity to move closer towards the edge of the base of support. Okay, now imagine that the axis of rotation forms a boundary. Okay, so that's the edge of the tires there that we're rolling up onto. If the center of gravity remains on the same side of the axis of rotation where it began, then gravity will restore the object and its center of gravity to its original position. Okay, so we're saying we push this truck up onto its edge. As long as center of gravity remains on the same side of that axis of rotation as where it started, then when we remove that torque and we stop pushing the bus, then it's going to, the the gravity is going to cause the truck to return back to its original position. If the center of gravity crosses the axis of rotation to the other side, then gravity will cause loss of equilibrium if no other forces are applied. So that's what we see in the picture on the right. Now enough torque has been applied that it pushed the truck far enough up on its edge, on its axis of rotation, then now the center of gravity is flipped to the opposite side of the tires. Okay, so now it, the gravity line of action has flipped to the other side. So now if no other force is applied, it's going to cause the truck to tip over. So this means that the closer the center of gravity is to the axis of rotation, the less torque is required to cause loss of equilibrium. So losing rotational stability or loss of equilibrium in this case just means we have to get the center of gravity to cross over the axis to the other side. So the closer the center of gravity is to the axis already, the less force will be required or the less torque it will take 
to get it to cross over to the other side. So we're saying that we have greater rotational stability when the center of gravity is further away from the axis. When it's further away, it will take a greater force to cause it to move all the way over to the other side of the axis. Rotational stability is also increased by lowering the center of gravity or moving the center of gravity toward the side where an external force is being applied. So that second part, moving the center of gravity toward where the force is being applied, that's the same as saying we're moving it away from the axis. So if the center of gravity is moving away from the axis toward the side where the force is applied, then it means we have further to go and more force that must be applied um, before we tip over. So it's like if you know somebody is going to tackle you from the front, you might lean into that person. You might put your hands out and lean your mask forward. You're leaning into the where the force is being applied and moving your center of mass away from the axis which would be whichever of your feet is further back because if they push you and you tip over you would be tipping from the posterior boundary of your body and where your body is making contact with the ground so you're going to lean your mass into the force and away from how you would be tipped over the size of the base of support is extremely important. So a larger base of support makes it more difficult for center of gravity to be moved outside of it. Okay, so the bigger the base of support is, the harder it is to get center of gravity to, to cross over the axis to the other side because it has a greater distance it has to go, which means a greater force with greater torque to push it outside of that. Um, this is especially true when base of support is made larger in the direction of the line of action of the externally applied force. So that's where we get into directional stability. So directional stability is a difference in stability depending on the direction of the applied force. So the direction matters a lot. Um, so like if you think about my example where you're going to be pushed from the front, like if you're playing football or something and someone's coming up to push you and you lean into them, you don't just lean into them, you would go into a split stance where you have one foot in front and one foot in the back. That's because we're increasing our base of support in the direction of the applied force. So it, that's much more effective than like, let's say I just stood with my uh, hips abducted and had my feet spread apart in a stance like this with my feet to the side that's not going to be effective at all because I have a very, very narrow base of support in that case. And so if they're pushing me this way, I would just tip right back over. But instead, I would go into a split stance, so one foot in front, one foot in back, and I would lean my center of mass forward. And that's going to increase my stability significantly, partly because of directional stability. A gymnast on a balance beam is more stable in the sagittal plane because the base of support is wider in that direction than in the frontal plane. So like a, someone, a gymnast who's on a balance beam and facing forward like she is in relation to the direction of the balance beam, she's much more stable in the sagittal plane because her base of support is wide in the sagittal plane. If she turned and faced us in this picture, then her base of support would be much greater in the frontal plane. And so then she would have directional stability in the frontal plane and be much less stable in the sagittal plane. Directional stability or instability may be used to an athlete's advantage by intentionally increasing stability in a certain direction or embracing instability in a certain direction to maximize mobility. Okay, so in some cases, we want to increase our stability like what I was describing where you're going into a split stance and you're trying not to be pushed over backwards. So in that case, you want to increase directional stability to be able to resist losing equilibrium. Uh, but there are cases where we want to intentionally lose our stability. We want to intentionally use that to our advantage in all sorts of different athletic activities. So here's an example is that a sprinter begins in a low position with the base of support widest in the sagittal plane with the feet on the starting blocks and tips of the fingers on the ground. 
Okay, so I'm sure you can visualize this and it's what I have in the picture here, except this is after they launched from the blocks. Um, so they'd have their feet on the blocks and their fingertips on the ground much in front of them. So they'd have a wide base of support in the sagittal plane while they're waiting. Uh, so this position offers sufficient stability while they're waiting for the race to start. But when the fingers are removed from the ground, the position is immediately unstable. So as soon as they pick up their fingers from the ground, now their base of support is their toes way back there and their center of mass is way in front of them. So they immediately lose their stability and they lose their equilibrium the minute they take their fingers off the ground. Without the fingers on the ground, the center of gravity is suddenly significantly anterior to the base of support. And this instability increases mobility and serves as an advantage for the sprinter taking off the starting blocks. Okay, so rather than starting from an upright position and having to overcome inertia and then start to run faster and faster, they're beginning by immediately losing their stability, which immediately increases their mobility. So they begin to move right away just due to the force of gravity. And that helps that. It's like they're using the force of gravity to help them overcome inertia in that stationary position. Okay, so that's just one example of how we use um, instability to our advantage on purpose. Okay, so we can use directional stability and instability for our advantage or our disadvantage, really. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this video, and I'll see you next time.